Welcome, welcome to To The Point. Today we have a very exciting program for you. We're going to talk about the miracle of energy in the universe. Now you're sitting watching me on television, but even to sit where you are, and for me to sit where I am, requires energy. We require energy to see, to hear, to breathe, to digest, and all sorts of other, other physiological processes. And just to sit in the chair requires energy. The whole universe is based on energy. And today we're going to talk about the miraculous process of energy transfer in the universe. And it is totally supernatural, completely supernatural. And there's no way that this process could ever have happened by chance. OK, let's uh, start. Um, let's start with the first picture of Jesus in heaven. Now, of course, Jesus is God and he created everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created all the matter in heaven and all the matter on earth. And Jesus said this in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. So who's got all the power? Answer, Jesus Christ. And it would take a huge amount of energy and power to create the universe. Huge amount of energy. And we'll be coming to the sun, and you'll, which is created, and you see how much power and energy comes from the sun. Right. Well, let's look at a picture now of the heavens and the earth. Uh, that uh, is actually the, uh, the solar system, the galaxies. And God created that. Uh, it's most amazing. It's very attractive. I don't know if any of you have saw my program, but actually that has a divine spiral in it, proving that God created it. Nevertheless, today we're going to talk about energy, and God used a lot of energy, I suspect, to create all that matter. Um, but it requires energy, as I say. Um, now, all matter is made of the next picture, uh, atoms, and that's what atoms look like. Um, there's, you have to have a, a, a special microscope to see them, but we're all made out of atoms. And the number of atoms in the universe is a huge number. Nobody knows exactly how many it is, but it's roughly 10 with 80,000 zeros after it. That's a large number. 10 with 80,000 zeros after it. Now, I want to look first at actually how a, an atom is made up. Don't worry, I'm not going to confuse you with lots of uh, nuclear physics. But I want you to look at the next picture, which is the electrical charges within the atom. And there you can see there's a central nucleus, which is made up of two parts. First of all, uh, protons which are positively charged, and neutrons, which have no charge at all. And then whizzing round uh, the central nucleus are lots of very high-speed electrons, which are negatively charged. And here's the first problem for evolutionists. You see positive and negative electrical charges attract each other, just like north and south poles of a magnet. So my first question to the evolutionists is, how on earth does this happen? Because if you've got uh, these high-speed electrons, which are negatively charged, whizzing round at vast speed, um, the uh, protons, which are positively charged, um, basically what should happen is that the electrons should implode into uh, the central nucleus. But actually, they don't. And that's a big puzzle for the evolutionists. Fortunately, the Bible tells us why. It's actually a miracle. Here is the biblical answer. It's in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says, the Son, that's the creator of the universe. His name is Jesus Christ. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. Very simply, God has uh, basically using his word. Jesus Christ in the New Testament is described as the word, in the beginning was the word, he's using his mighty power to keep those electrons whizzing round the nucleus and not imploding. He would only have to withdraw his power and they would implode and the whole of the universe would, would, would be one giant nuclear explosion. One day he will. In 2 Peter 3, we're told that the earth will dissolve and the heavens will dissolve in fire and then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, when we come to energy, 
we need to look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 when God said, let there be light and then there was light. Now let's look and see what light actually is. In the next image, which is actually photons, they're subatomic particles moving very, very fast um, and they produce all the energy from the sun. They're called photons and they're moving in a, in a waveform. Um, so the light is actually uh, photons moving in um, a waveform. Now I want to move on to a famous equation which you may have heard of. It's Einstein's famous equation of mass and energy equivalence. You've probably heard of it, E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light. So there is a relationship between energy, mass, and the speed of light. I emphasize speed there because speed is, is one parameter of time. Um, so when God said, let there be light, that's when time started. Now remember that God lives outside time completely. It says in Isaiah 43, verse 13, from eternity to eternity, I am God. That's what God said. From eternity to eternity, I am God. God lives outside time. Now, I'm going to try and explain in very simple terms, in a rather funny sort of way, uh, what time is. It's the fourth dimension. It's the fourth dimension. Uh, we're, we're actually familiar with three dimensions, height, width, and depth. You can probably see this plastic box there. It's got height and width and depth, and you'll be familiar with that. But I want to introduce to you a fourth dimension. So I've just got a small model of me. <laughs> can you see the small model of me? I'm going to put the small model of me, this is a small model of me, in the box. And I'm going to close the box like that. And there you have me encapsulated in time. And that's where I am, and that's where you are right now. You're encapsulated in the fourth dimension called time. There are actually 11 dimensions that we know about called time, but actually there are, uh, sorry, there are four, 11 dimensions. Um, most of them are in subatomic physics. Um, there may be many more, but the fourth dimension is time. Now, God lives outside time, and remember, he chose us before the foundation of the earth. He saw us in our mother's womb when we were formed in secret in our mother's womb. He saw us nine months later when we came out into the world and everybody picked us up and cuddled us. He saw us when we were going through school. He saw us as teenagers. He saw us uh, later on as adults, and he also sees us in heaven all at the same time. And that's how God can uh, very well, and only God can predict the future, because he lives outside time in eternity. I'm going to be spending a whole program just talking about time and the Bible. Right. Let's look at the source of energy in our universe. It's actually the sun. I want to talk briefly about the sun. Uh, it's a giant nuclear fusion reactor. Um, now, we can't do nuclear fusion. Men can't, humans can't do nuclear fusion. There's a very good reason for that. Um, here is what men do. It's called nuclear fission. And nuclear fission is what happens in a nuclear power station. It's also happened in Nagasaki and Hiroshima in 1945 in the end of World War II. It's actually a very inefficient form of producing energy. For example, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the bomb was actually called Little Boy. And what they actually did was they got conventional explosives and, and, and using those ex uh, conventional explosives, they got some um, uranium and exploded the uranium and compressed it into some more radioactive uranium, and that caused an explosion. But only a tiny amount of the um, energy was actually released as nuclear power. Unlike, and it's the same with uh, nuclear power stations, only the tiny percentage is actually released as nuclear power. Uh, and of course, nuclear power stations also produce a lot of waste. Which brings me back to the sun again, which is God's process of producing power. And here we have an image of nuclear fusion in the sun. The details don't matter 
greatly. All you need to know is that uh, four atoms of hydrogen are converted into one atom of helium, releasing a huge amount of energy with 100% efficiency. There is no nuclear waste at all, and it's very controlled, otherwise the sun would explode. Uh, the temperature in the sun is 15 million degrees centigrade. That's why we can't do nuclear fusion on Earth. The temperature in the sun is 15 million degrees centigrade, and the pressure at the center of the, uh, of the sun is 340 billion times the air pressure on Earth at sea level. So huge temperatures and huge pressure, and that's how God does uh, nuclear fusion. And let me tell you, it is completely supernatural. Only God can do that. For example, every second, 700 million tons of hydrogen are converted into helium. How often? Every second, with an amazing amount of energy released as um, heat and light. Now, energy is uh, contained within the so-called electromagnetic spectrum in the next picture. And we can only see part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum includes uh, radio waves and gamma rays and X-rays, uh, infrared waves, and the part of visible light that we can see, which actually happen to be the seven colors of the rainbow as well, the seven colors of visible light. Um, now, the next thing you need to know is that the energy from the sun is potentially quite dangerous to us, which is why God has produced um, a, a shield in the upper stratosphere on the next picture. So that all those X-rays and gamma rays and infrared rays and all the other waves are filtered out by the upper stratosphere. And I'd like to ask the evolutionists how they think that happened by chance. Because how much time have the evolutionists got to develop an upper stratosphere that selectively uh, filters out all the dangerous waves that would, would otherwise damage our DNA, our deoxyribonucleic acid, which is the most complex and powerful genetic code in the universe. And you've got DNA in every, every single cell of your 100 trillion cells in your body. Well, I'll tell you how much time the evolutionists have got. They've got no time at all, because if those uh, um, dangerous waves, X-rays, gamma rays, uh, infrared, and all the other rays come through and damage our DNA, we will die very quickly. Right, uh, this is another example of what they call irreducible complexity. Now, the sunlight comes down as photons to factories, which you and I call vegetation. Every time we look out of the, uh, in a beautiful garden, or we look out in a forest, or we look out in the countryside, and we see green plants, what are you actually looking at is actually a massive factory. That's what you're looking at. That is how God makes oxygen and food for you and me. Also, you and I exhale acid called carbon dioxide. And God has arranged that these wonderful factories called plants, they love carbon dioxide. And what they do is they do a most wonderful thing which we can't do called photosynthesis. Um, what they do is they combine water and carbon dioxide and make oxygen and food for us. And it is totally miraculous and we can't do it. Now the photosynthesis actually happens in all the food and all the alg algae in the water all over the Earth. And remember that two-thirds of planet Earth is actually water, and that's where most of the algae actually live. And but they do an awful lot of the production of oxygen for the Earth. Um, now, I want to look next at the next slide, which is actually called photosynthesis. This is the uh, very posh word, if you like, for the uh, amazing uh, biochemical reaction that happens in all factories, which you and I call plants. Um, it is actually very complicated, and I have dedicated a whole program just to photosynthesis. Basically, what happens is um, water and carbon, di carbon dioxide is trapped in sp inside special molecules called chlorophyll. Um, and in the chlor chlorophyll, using very, very, very complicated biochemical processes, um, the, um, those products, water and carbon dioxide, are converted into oxygen and starch, 
which is basically complex sugar. Now, when we eat our bread, we're eating starch. And of course, we do sometimes eat animals, but of course, how do they get their nutrition? The answer is from plants, which is basically starch. Now, this process of photosynthesis is 100% efficient. Unlike anything we can do, we do try and make efficient processes. We've got our nuclear reactors and we've got our um, photo cells on the top of buildings, but they're very, very inefficient. Now, God is into 100% efficiency. Uh, we would love to be able to do photosynthesis, but unfortunately, we can't. Um, here's another image of the photosynthesis reaction. I'm not going to talk now about in detail about the photosynthesis reaction, except to say it's really, really complicated. You can get textbooks and textbooks and textbooks on photosynthesis, and let me tell you, they're thousands and thousands of pages long. This is a really, really complex uh, 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 chemical process. And there's one thing I can guarantee you, that photosynthesis did not happen by chance. No way did that ever, ever happen by chance. Right, so the oxygen is released into the air and taken up by our respiratory system. So I'd like to look at that, the respiratory system in the next image. Now, the air is taken in to our lungs and our lungs have um, little sacs called alveoli. And the total surface area of our lungs is about the size of a tennis court. And uh, we breathe in and out. We breathe in and, and we breathe out. Uh, we're taking air into our lungs and breathing it out. As we take air into our lungs, we're taking in oxygen. As we breathe out, we're exhaling uh, waste, which is called carbon dioxide, which is acid, which, of course, the plants love. Um, our lungs inhale about 2 million litres of air every day. The surface air of the lungs, as I told you, is the same size as a tennis court. On average, you breathe about 23,000 times a day. You take 600 million breaths during your lifetime, roughly. Um, and at rest, the adult body takes in and breathes out about six litres of air each minute. So these, uh, these lungs are really working hard to get the oxygen out of the air and into your cells. Now, the capillaries, the little blood vessels in the lungs, if you were to put them end to end, they would be over 1,000 miles long. Now, in order for the oxygen to uh, move, what we call perfuse, across the membrane, the alveolar membrane, the lining of the lung, it, the surface tension uh, within the alveolar sac, sac must be exactly correct. Otherwise, those little bubbles called uh, alveolar sacs, they would simply collapse. They're kept, they're kept uh, as a little bubble by the surface tension. And that is related to the partial pressure of the atmosphere in the air. Um, it would be no good um, uh, having a different partial pressure in the atmosphere in the air because our lungs would not work. That's why, for example, pilots who fly high up in the air either, either have to have pressurized um, cabins or oxygen masks. It's all to do with the partial pressure. Right, let's move on now to how oxygen is actually transported to uh, the... 100 trillion cells in our body. Uh, this happens using hemoglobin, which is a totally supernatural molecule. It's one of the most complex molecules known to man. And basically, it, it specializes in taking on, carbon, on oxygen in the lungs, transporting them into the cells, and releasing oxygen and car taking up the waste product called carbon dioxide. Um, and by the way, hemoglobin carries iron in it is a very important part of, it, part of it. If you have too little iron, you're going to die of anemia. You've probably heard of iron deficiency anemia. But what you possibly didn't know is that iron is very toxic. If you have too much iron, you will also die of iron toxicity. So God has carefully arranged everything so we don't die, which is a big problem for the evolutionists. There's no ch chance involved here. Uh, you can't, this must be worked perfectly, perfectly first time, otherwise we'd all be dead. Now, we let, now need to look at this circulatory system, which is how the, or, this uh, organ called the blood is transported around the body. Um, th I've actually spent uh, one program just talking about the circulatory system. It's basically a very complex pump, which pumps the blood through the arteries, the veins, and the capillaries. There are 10 pints of blood, roughly, in our bodies, and uh, 
every day we produce about 100 billion red blood cells in our bone marrows and 2 million red blood cells every second. Uh, the total length of our circulatory system is 60,000 miles, uh, which is twice the distance around the Earth. And in one day, the blood travels a total of 12,000 miles. It's an incredibly powerful and complex arrangement. Again, it's an example of irreducible complexity. It is so complex but so important that oxygen gets to the lung is how much time have the evolutionists got to evolve a perfect circulatory system with all the valves and the heart and everything else? Answer, no time at all. Otherwise, the, the human body would simply be dead. It's as simple as that. Now let's talk about the human brain, only, be only because the brain uses 20% of the energy available in the, oxygen, in the body, and our brains are super powerful computers. They're more powerful than a thousand NASA supercomputers, and they do millions and millions of calculations every second, most of which you're not aware of, but I will be talking about that on another program. There are about 45 miles of nerves running through our bodies, and the messages travel through the uh, nerves at about 250 miles an hour. Now, um, if you deprive your brain of oxygen, within 30 seconds you're dead. Sorry, within 30 seconds you're unconscious, within four minutes you're dead. Which is why, again, says the evolutionist, how much time have you got to develop the circulatory system to make sure oxygen gets to the brain answer a maximum of 30 seconds. <laughs> not a, not, not a, no more, because the human, the human brain will be unconscious after 30 seconds, which is why I keep emphasizing everything you see around you, everything living, is supernatural, created by God. Right, let's move on to the digestive system now. Um, I've done a separate program on the digestive system, but basically this extracts all the food uh, from our um, all the food and the uh, different parts of our food. It's incredibly complex, as I've explained in that program. Um, let's move on to the endocrine system, which is the next picture. The endocrine system. Um, there are different parts of the endocrine system, and I will be dwelling on different parts of it. But just to show you again how complex this thing, you've probably heard of insulin, which is produced by the pancreas there in that picture. Now, insulin is a very important hormone which causes glucose to go into the cells, sugar to go into the cells. In other words, energy to go into the cells. If your blood sugar is too low, uh, you will go unconscious. If your blood sugar is too high, you will fit. Uh, the blood sugar must be exactly right. People who have high blood sugar are diabetic. Uh, how much time has the, God to, uh, has the evolutionist got to get it right? None at all. Others would all be diabetics or unconscious. The energy is, is actually processed in mitochondria, which are highly complex factories in every single one of our 100 trillion cells. And in order to process the energy, they use what's called the Krebs citric acid cycle. I'm going to spend a whole program just describing the Krebs citric acid cycle. Unbelievably complex. I cannot tell you how complex this is. All medical students have to, st have to study an elementary version of the Krebs citric acid cycle, produce energy. Let me tell you what the Bible says in Psalm 1 about fools. Um, there's a picture of a fool. This is what God says about them. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. People who don't believe in God are fools. I didn't say that. God did. You may have a problem with what I said, but that, that's what actually God says. So let's look now at the creator, Jesus Christ. It says about Jesus in, chap in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus said in Matthew 28, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. In Isaiah 40, verse 28, it says, There is no limit 
to his wisdom. God is unbelievably scientific and super intelligent. Um, and wherever we look in the universe, you're looking at the supernatural processes of God. These programs, we'd love to have feedback. Please send us some feedback at info at revelationtv.com. You can also get on my website, which is freechristianteaching.org. I hope you're enjoying these programs. Please join us again soon on To The Point, which is all about God's supernatural universe. God bless you and thank you for joining us. <laughs>